Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good evening it is for us, but good afternoon to you all. Um, welcome back from, from lunch for the second uh, keynote. We are very privileged indeed to have uh, Stella Nordhagen present to us. Um, Stella is a senior technical specialist at, at GAIN, uh, where she focuses on monitoring food systems. Um, she trained in agricultural econo economics. She's a native of Colorado, but did her uh, PhD and the research started at Cambridge um, University. So she has worked mainly on undernutrition in more than a dozen countries um, and is now, of course, converging like we all are on uh, the ideas of malnutrition in all its forms and joining that up with sustainability. And for those of us in the food monitoring space, uh, thinking about how do we measure um, malnutrition in all its forms or progress towards reducing it, as well as progress to improving food sustainability for systems. So she's got a real passion for science and a real passion for improving nutrition and food systems. So um, Stella, wonder to, wonderful to have you. You'll give us a presentation and leave us uh, some time for questions at the end. So over to you, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much, Boyd. Um, and a real pleasure, pleasure to be with you all here today, uh, virtually, um, to present on addressing the food, nutrition and environmental sustainability nexus in food systems monitoring. And before I get into kind of the, the meat of the presentation on monitoring, I did just want to motivate for all of us just why this is so important and why it's so urgent. Um, this is because food systems transformation is urgently needed for human health, um, which I think all of us on this call would agree with, but it's also urgently needed for planetary health. On the human health and nutrition side, as most of us know, stunting continues to afflict nearly one quarter of all children. And this isn't just about children being too short for their age, but this is associated with increased mortality and morbidity and can cause severe irreversible physical and cognitive damage, lowering earning potential of those children later in their lives, as well as economic growth at the level of the entire country. So the consequences of stunting can really last a lifetime. At the same time, still on the other nutrition side, micronutrient deficiencies are even more widespread. They affect an estimated 2 million people worldwide, including half of children under age five. And the consequences of different types of micronutrient deficiencies include increased disease risk, weakened bones, impaired cognitive development, poor vision, general weakness. Combined, undernutrition is a cause of 3.1 million child deaths every year, or about 45% of all child deaths. And undernutrition, is an issue that arises largely due to inadequate diets, particularly in children. For example, UNICEF estimates that nearly 60% of young children do not get the needed nutrients from animal source foods, and 44% of them don't get any fruits or vegetables. And I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but at the same time, overweight and obesity rates are continuing to rise. Um, so while we see this still kind of um, in, intractable burden of undernutrition all around the world, we're also dealing with the other side of the double burden of overweight, obesity, and diet-related non-communicable diseases. Currently, most risk factors for high burden diseases are linked to diet, including all of those highlighted here, with poor quality diets resulting in about 11 million deaths per year. And then still on the, on the health perspective, there's an often forgotten health issue with the food system. Um, there's food safety. Foodborne diseases cause about 600 million illnesses and about half a million premature deaths annually, with three quarters of those being in low and middle income countries. The graph here shows the burden of foodborne illness by region. And you can see that Africa's per, per capita foodborne disease burden is about 27 times that of Europe and North America. So I'm sure I'm again preaching to the choir when I say this, but food systems currently are connected to several serious human health issues. And as shown in this graph, these are also serious equity issues, both across countries and within them. But food systems challenges go well beyond human health. Improving environmental sustainability of the global food system is equally essential. Climate change currently poses a truly existential threat to life as it's currently lived. 
warming um, at two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels is likely to lead to changes in precipitation, rising sea levels, increased frequency and severity of extreme events, loss of biodiversity, lowered agricultural productivity, and increased hunger and disease. And really, at this point, warming at two degrees Celsius is kind of the optimistic scenario, um, because progress on addressing this issue has been much too slow. And countries so far have collectively failed to halt the growth in greenhouse gas emissions. At this point, deep cuts are urgently required to even um, maintain any hope of staying below that two degrees increase. And above it, the things get a bit scary in terms of the projection for what the climate system will look like. But at the same time, um, the Earth's water systems are also overburdened and polluted. Deforestation and habitat destruction are ongoing, and biodiversity is lost daily. So climate change is a major environmental challenge facing the food system, but it's far from the only one. And the food system really plays an important role in these types because the environmental impacts of food and agriculture are massive. Food is responsible for about a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions, but also 70% of global freshwater use, and nearly 80% of global ocean and freshwater pollution results from food systems. And this can lead to eutrophication, which is when there's excess nutrients in the water, and that leads to excessive growth of plants and algae, which can harm water quality and biodiversity, making it impossible for kind of the original aquatic ecosystem to function. So in order to meet these goals of both human and planetary health, transformation of the food system is urgently needed. And monitoring plays an essential role in that food system's transformation. It's how we know what needs to change and whether or not it's changing. And it's also, and very importantly, the basis of holding leaders to account so that they can act to transform food systems towards more sustainable and healthy outcomes. Good news um, for all of us is that within food systems, we're, we're quite lucky because a lot of great work has already been done in the past on food systems monitoring. And to take us back a bit, this began um, over a century ago at the global level in the 1910s when the predecessor to the FAO started publishing for the first time ever official government statistics on food prices and food stocks. In 1930, it conducted the first agricultural census, and in 1947, the just-founded FAO uh, released its first ever food and agriculture report, which is, is shown here. And this was a report that was about 18 pages long. Um, it reported on cereals, potatoes, sugars, and fats, um, plus a few non-food products. Didn't include any tables or figures, and it sold at a cost of 20 cents. Now, 75 years later, uh, the State of Food and Agriculture Report is still published by the FAO, and it's been joined by a whole bunch of other flagship publications from the FAO on um, things like fisheries, commodity markets, forests, and one that we're probably all quite familiar with on food security and nutrition. We also have the Global Nutrition Report, the IFRI Global Food Policy Report, the statistics that are provided by the FAO on FAO stat, work on dietary risk factors available from the GBD, various countdown reports put out by the Lancet, such as those on NCDs. Several different initiatives have sprung up focused on specifically tracking private sector actions related to nutrition and food, such as the Access to Nutrition Initiative and work by the World Benchmarking Alliance. Um, plus, of course, uh, as you all know, very well, there's the work of Informas to try and monitor foods environments um, to reduce diet-related NCDs. In addition to all this multitude of reports and initiatives, specifically on food and nutrition, there are other major occurring reports, such as the State of the World's Children Report by UNICEF for the World Bank's World Development Report, or also the big IPCC assessment reports, which regularly include some coverage of topics related to food and food systems. Um, but despite all this impressive amount of monitoring uh, and reporting that's going on, there's still some gaps left to be filled. One of these has to do with um, user friendliness and interactivity. A lot of the food systems monitoring data that's currently presented is presented in kind of a, a static form where the user can't really interact with it or shape it to be representing the types of data for the types of areas that they care about. There's also a lot of gaps around policy relevance and usability. Um, I think Informas is a real exception in this area because a lot of other initiatives maybe aren't 
trying to make sure that the data that they're collecting and putting out there is relevant for policy, um, whereas I think that's a, that's a real focus of the, the InfraMass work. A lot of the data out there is not very timely. Um, is there's a long lag between when data is collected and when it's reported and made available for use. In a lot of different existing reports and monitoring processes, there aren't clear criteria for why certain indicators or certain data were included and others weren't. There are also major gaps in data that's available and also in its coverage, uh, both across countries and over time. And the final challenge, which is the one that I'm going to focus on today, is the fact that a lot of the data that's currently collected and put out there is siloed among different fields. So environmental sustainability issues are rarely presented alongside those related to nutrition and health. And this is an important gap because nutrition and sustainability are interacting challenges and they can't be addressed in silos from one another. Solving both jointly requires understanding more about what's going on in the other domain. For example, um, animal source foods are highly nutrient dense and they can play a key role in addressing nutrient gaps in areas where they're underconsumed, particularly for groups that are highly vulnerable to undernutrition, such as pregnant lactating women or infants and young children. But of course, as, as all of you know, some have also been associated with health problems when they're consumed in excess. And they also have a relatively large environmental impact. Livestock is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, contributing about 15% of emissions. They use about 30 to 40% of global land and 8 to 10% of global water. In addition, excess nitrogen and phosphorus that's released from livestock systems can contaminate ecosystems, harming plants and animals. And these environmental impacts, while generally large, vary considerably by setting, by production system, and by the type of animal that we're considering. So in order to decide how a given decision maker, policy maker, should move forward on the question of animal source food production promotion within a given context, they need data not only on diets and nutrition, but also on environmental sustainability. And they need a way in which they can kind of consider both of those topics jointly to inform that decision. And this is true not just for animal source foods, but in general, nutrition and health and environmental sustainability are intricately connected through diets and through food systems. So if we want to improve both simultaneously, which for both human and planetary health, we really need to do, it requires much more integrated approaches to monitoring. So I'd like to tell you about two recent initiatives um, that are trying to address these gaps and bring these kind of two topics closer together. There are, of course, many others, but these are two with which I'm involved directly, so I wanted to focus on them. And the first of these is the Food Systems Dashboard, which is a collaboration between GAIN, my organization, Johns Hopkins University, the FAO, and other partners. And I encourage you to go and check out the website. You can see the URL at the bottom of the page here um, and see it for yourself. But the goals of the dashboard are really three. The first is just to describe food systems, to present a snapshot of data across all of the different important aspects and outcomes of food systems so we can improve stakeholders' understanding of current food systems. The second is to, to diagnose, to enable stakeholders to determine the challenges that each country faces within their own food system. And then the final one is based on that diagnosis to decide, to suggest priority areas of action that can improve food systems contributions to both environmental sustainability and to better health and nutrition. So the dashboard organizes its data and its visualizations along a food systems framework, which is based on a modified version of that of the Committee on World Food Security's high level panel of experts. So we have data that looks at food supply chains, at food environments, at the individual factors that motivate food choices, at consumers' behavior, and then at the different outcomes. So first kind of the intermediate outcome of diets, what people actually eat, but then the impacts of diets on nutrition and health, on the environment, and also related to livelihoods. And finally, we have data about different external drivers of the food system and food system change. Things related to, for example, population urbanization, climate change, or globalization and trade. 
And the dashboard currently houses over 200 indicators from over 40 sources for 230 countries, about 630,000 different data points. We have 24 indicators related to those drivers of food system change, 31 indicators on food supply chains, 45 indicators for food environments, 13 indicators on individual factors driving dietary choice, 42 indicators on infant and young child feeding and dietary intake, 23 indicators on nutritional status and NCDs, and also 21 indicators that are bringing in the environmental sustainability angle and adding that to the kind of health and nutrition side. I mean, you've noticed I jumped over a bit the uh, indicators on consumer behavior. It's because we currently don't have any. We have zero indicators in that, um, which I'll come back to later. But that's basically because that's a bit of a gap that currently hasn't yet been filled in terms of data. There's both conceptual work needed regarding the definition of standard indicators and how to collect them, and then also just actually going out and kind of collecting that data and making it, it available um, in a cross-country comparable high-quality way so that it can be featured on something like the dashboard. But that section aside, we have um, over 200 indicators covering many different aspects of food systems. And the dashboard allows users to do multiple different types of visualizations of all of this data. So they can compare food systems across countries and also over time. Um, so you can see here there's a map visualization. So you can look at uh, different countries comparing, for example, here this is greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. You can also do a bar chart um, to compare countries through that way, which is shown in the green chart with a share of employment in agriculture. Uh, you can look over time and see how that changes. Here's the global level of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture in the bottom left. And you can also do bubble charts to compare up to three indicators um, and track how those look across different countries. And most of the data in the dashboard, nearly all of it, is pulled automatically from different outside websites. So it updates immediately when the original data source is updated. For example, if the FAO collect new data on agricultural yields and they upload that to FAO stat, the dashboard will be automatically pulling data from FAO stat. So it'll show up in the dashboard with the new figures as soon as they are added on the FAO. In addition to those cross country comparisons, the dashboard also provides kind of easy to read individual dashboards at the level of a given country. So this is an example for Ethiopia. Um, and you can see that it has certain key curated indicators for different aspects of food systems that are presented in an easy to read visualization related to food supply chains. You can see things like cereal yields for food environments. You can see things like the share of dietary energy that comes from cereals, roots, and tubers. Individual factors, you can see the proportion of household consumption spent on food and beverages. And then at drivers of food system change, you can see things related to um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the Gini index, and the urbanization rate. And you can also look at data by different income classifications across countries, by different regions of the world, and also by food system type, um, which is four or five types of food systems that uh, we define based on key indicators that kind of describe the way that food systems tend to transition from rural traditional food systems up to industrialized and consolidated food systems. All of the data that's uh, presented on the dashboard can be downloaded in its raw form, so you can conduct additional analyses. And also the metadata is easily available on the dashboard, so you can see the definition of the indicator, where the data actually comes from, how it should be interpreted, um, and how it's calculated for any calculated indicators. And as I mentioned before, one of the unique added values of the dashboard is that it's able to fuse these environmental sustainability indicators with diet and nutrition indicators. So it has indicators related to food supply chains and environments, like related to, to production or processing or marketing. For diets and nutrition, food security, nutritional status, rates of diet-related uncommunicable diseases, but also these sustainability indicators, such as um, production sustainability aspects like land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, and on the consumption side, um, eutrophication rates, the ecological footprint of food production, and levels of biodiversity loss associated with food consumption. So to give you an example, this is one of my, um, my personal favorite 
environmental indicators that's included on the dashboard. And this is the number of Earths that would be required to support the food system if everyone on the planet lived like the average individual within that particular country. So you can see for the US, for example, um, if everybody in the world ate like the typical American, then we would need five planet Earths to be able to provide that kind of food. In Switzerland, where I live, um, we're doing a little bit better. We have uh, just 2.9 Earths required, but obviously there's only one Earth available, so that's still a bit of a challenge. And you can see also some really interesting variations even within a given region. So if you look at the Middle Eastern region, you can see that this varies from less than half a planet um, if everybody were to eat like the average person in Yemen, up to almost nine planet Earths would be required to support the diet of the average person in Qatar if everybody ate that way. So that's just a, a fun example of a type of environmental indicator that can be viewed there. And now returning to the example I, I mentioned earlier about animal source foods, um, here's an example of how one could use a tool like the dashboard to look across both health and nutrition as well as environmental indicators to kind of inform decisions of it. So on the vertical axis here is the, the stunting rate, which I'm using as a bit of a proxy for undernutrition in general. Horizontal access is sh showing the per capita greenhouse gas emissions of food consumption. And the size of the bubble indicates the per capita red meat intake within that country. And this is all national level data. And by looking at this, you can see that there are some, some different groups that one might be able to pull out. Kind of at the bottom right of the graph, there is these countries that have very high levels of emissions, low rates of stunting, and fairly high levels of meat consumption. And this is one where you could suggest maybe a fairly obvious policy priority. And that's that the greenhouse gas emissions are really very high compared to other countries. It seems fairly urgent to get those under control. And there's not so much of a worry about stunting rates with high meat consumption. It seems likely that that country could reduce their livestock production and consumption and have positive environmental benefits without necessarily having any, any harm related to undernutrition. Then you could make a, a different cluster of countries looking at kind of those on the other side of the graph that have low levels of emissions, but very high rates of stunting and also very low rates of meat consumption. And this is one where because of the nutrient density that exists within meat and within other types of animal source foods, that low level of consumption is probably one driver, certainly not the only driver, but one driver that might be leading to high levels of undernutrition as proxied here by high levels of stunting. So to get that stunting rate down, it might actually be better for those countries to consider finding ways to sustainably increase production and consumption of meat within that country, given how low their greenhouse gas emissions are already. Certainly they should try to do that in the most environmentally sustainable way possible, but maybe their decisions at this point shouldn't be primarily focused on that question of reducing per capita greenhouse gas emissions from food, because they're already at the extreme low end of that distribution, whereas they're at the extreme high end of the distribution for stunting rates and for meat consumption, and the low, low end for meat consumption. Um, and then there's maybe another cluster you could make where you have countries that have high emissions and high stunting and low levels of meat consumption. Here, it's a real challenge. They need to reduce their rates of greenhouse gas emissions and their rates of stunting, but suggesting to do reduce greenhouse gas emissions through reduced meat consumption is probably not going to be a very promising policy avenue because the levels are already so low that it's unlikely that a lot of the food of the footprint of their emissions is coming from that particular sector. So you need to reduce emissions, but maybe you should look elsewhere. Obviously, this is a very simplistic example, um, and a lot of other things need to be considered, but I hope it gives you a bit of an idea of kind of how you can look at environmental and health and nutrition indicators jointly to try and make some, some more informed types of um, decisions than looking at any single indicator in isolation. To date, the, uh, the food systems dashboard is largely descriptive. It mostly just kind of presents data and allows the user to interact with that data in various different ways. But in the future, we plan to expand that um, so that we can use it to actually diagnose food systems performance. The goal is to use that data to measure food systems performance to inform policy recommendations. 
And we're doing this through three different steps. First is kind of deciding what are the main goals that we want food systems to influence, including both nutrition and health outcomes, but also those related to environmental sustainability. Next, we identify sentinel indicators that are associated with achieving each of those goals. And then finally, we develop targets and a bit of a traffic light system that um, associated, is associated with each chosen sentinel indicator and can give the user an idea of where a country falls when it comes to their performance along that indicator. So here's an example um, for two different indicators we have now. Uh, the first one, stunting rates in children under five. For this type of indicator, there are kind of globally suggested thresholds of less than 10% prevalence of stunting determined to be of low public health significance, with greater than 20% of stunting rates determined to be high public health significance. So based on that, and kind of looking at the distribution of the data shown here in, in the histogram, we're able to suggest some thresholds for countries where stunting probably isn't a major concern, those in green, and countries where it is really a priority area for intervention, those in red above 20%, as well as a yellow area in between where it's a bit might be a priority, um, needs to be, needs to be looked into a bit more. And then the second example, we did similarly for um, crop species richness uh, or the average number of crops per unit of land, which is an important environmental indicator related to, to biodiversity. And there isn't really global consensus on kind of what is the right threshold here, but based on the existing literature, as well as looking at a distribution of kind of what the data looks like and where there are existing natural peaks and breaks in it, uh, we identified a similar threat to set of thresholds with fewer than three crop species being a likely challenge area, above seven crops per unit of land, suggesting that that country is doing just fine in terms of crop diversity. And again, that kind of yellow area in the middle, um, suggesting kind of another thing to look into, but we can't necessarily make a decision. So the plan is to do a similar process um, with a couple dozen indicators across all different aspects of food systems to be able to create this kind of quick diagnosis of likely and potential problem areas for that particular food system that could suggest priority areas um, in which the decision makers might um, look to be able to guide their food systems transformation. And this is soon to be added to the dashboard website. And finally, um, after performing that diagnosis, we want to be able to help policymakers and other stakeholders decide. So providing them with a list of different recommendations for potential interventions they might consider, given the challenges that were diagnosed for their food system. At present, the dashboard presents the 42 policies and actions that were identified by Corinna Hawks and colleagues last year, which is a short list of actions primarily related to health and nutrition that were distilled down from over 200 recommendations from 12 major global reports and validated with a group of experts. So these are all um, kind of high evidence, high potential impact policies that can help to improve food security and nutrition. And you can see some of the examples at the bottom. So things like comprehensive school food programs, public food procurement policies, agricultural extension programs, and providing women with agricultural assets. Going forward, we want to be able to add to these health and nutrition policies a set of vetted environmental sustainability policies. And then next, to be able to link these recommendations for potential policies or other interventions to the indicators of food system performance that I presented in the prior slide, that diagnose feature. And there's a few other um, projects that we have associated with expanding the dashboard. Uh, currently ongoing, we're working to develop different subnational dashboards where we can present data, not just at the national level across countries, but at the level of subnational regions, um, or even perhaps at the level of cities within a country. We are always working to add more indicators as they become collected with sufficient um, coverage across countries and sufficient quality. And very importantly, we're always working to encourage more uptake and use of the dashboard among stakeholders.
In the future, we also want to expand the dashboard so that it's not just kind of presenting static data for different aspects of food systems, but it gives a bit of the perspective on kind of how the food system actually works as a system. That is kind of what are the different interactions and feedbacks and dynamics among its parts? How might a change in the food supply chain result in a change in diets? or how might a change in diets result in a change in environmental outcomes. So we're working to build in those types of um, capabilities. We're also hoping to add more real-time data, particularly for indicators that change regularly, such as food prices, and also trying to expand the coverage of the dashboard and other important food systems outcomes like livelihoods, equity, resilience, and governance. So please do go and, and check it out, because um, I think those, there's a lot of data there that will be of interest to the people who are involved with the symposium. And there's one other ongoing project that I wanted to mention. Um, this one's really brand new, so it's kind of still at the conceptual stage. This is a project to monitor food systems transformation in the countdown to the 2030 global goals. And this project is an independent science-based global initiative. Um, it's led by Jess Fanzo, Lawrence Haddad, and Jose Rosero Mancayo, um, but currently has 46 members from 27 institutions across all continents. And it aims to support the post food system summit progress by establishing a framework, setting targets, identifying trade-offs among outcomes, and reporting and disseminating data on progress towards food systems transformation. It aims to complement different other global and regional monitoring and tracking initiatives, things like the, the Global Nutrition Report, uh, the work of Inframas, um, and the Accountability Pact um, that Boyd has been involved with recently, and kind of add to that um, by presenting a framework and also prevent, presenting different types of, of data across all aspects of, of food systems. It will present its data along five thematic areas with four or five different indicator domains within each of those areas. These include diets, nutrition, and health, environment and climate, livelihoods, poverty, and equity, as well as cross-cutting issues related to food systems governance and resilience and sustainability. And across all of these different thematic areas, we really want to make sure that the indicators that we choose to present are relevant to that area, the topic of food systems transformation, that they're of high quality, that they're easily interpretable, they kind of point in a, in a particular direction for a decision, and also that they're useful, that they can really translate into action on the part of policymakers and other stakeholders. So we, um, as you saw in the, in the prior slide, we re recently had a paper out in food policy that's a bit of a call to action on the subject. So do go and check it out to learn more about this initiative. We're aiming to begin a consultative process on selecting the key indicators over the next few months. We'll put out a baseline report on the state of food systems globally in 2022 or 2023. And then after that, we'll follow up with biannual updates and additional new analyses building on that original data. And definitely we recognize that we, we hope this is an ambitious undertaking, but that it's you know only one kind of small uh, drop in the pond. So we want to inspire others to take action and build the evidence base, um, but also to use this evidence to hold decision makers to account. So despite um, kind of all of that work that's already happened and that is ongoing, um, I do think there are still a few areas where there are some gaps and some additional work that's needed to support better food systems monitoring that integrates nutrition and health alongside environmental sustainability issues. Uh, so just before closing, I'll go through a few of my ideas about kind of what some of these um, future needs might be. And one of these is the one that I, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the indicators on the dashboard. And that's that we need more high coverage and validated indicators related to consumer behavior. So food acquisition, food preparation, meal practices, food storage within the home. We know that all of these aspects are important drivers of consumers' diets, as well as things like food loss and waste. But there are very few indicators that exist 
for which they've really been um, validated, agreed upon, and collected across a large number of countries, which is why we don't have any data on that on the dashboard is because it just doesn't kind of exist at the, the scope and quality that's needed for that. So that's an important gap to be filled. Then I think there's several gaps related to making sustainability metrics that can be relevant to consumer choices and also the choices of, of policymakers related to how they, they steer consumer choices. Some of these would be related to coming up with clear, easily interpretable metrics for environmental sustainability of foods as well as overall diets. And there already exist some uh, different kind of planetary health diets and different indicators for how sustainable a food is. But often these don't integrate all different aspects of environmental sustainability, or they kind of reflect an idealized global diet or global selection of foods, which isn't very um, reflective of the way in which people actually eat within diverse contexts. So we need sustainability metrics that encompass um, the way that people really eat in the real world, that they're diverse, they're locally relevant, and they're realistic. In addition, um, it'd be great to have some more work that integrates nutrition and health alongside sustainability. We still kind of have two separate sets of data and metrics that can't really bring them together in one way to suggest how you might make a joint decision looking at both nutrition and health as well as sustainability. Um, and in the future, this is something that if we want to kind of steer consumers' choices towards diets that are both healthier and more sustainable, it's important to think about kind of how are they going to make those choices. So how can we look at perhaps food labeling to include not only the existing nutrition and health guidance, but also guidance on environmental sustainability and present that in a way that lets a consumer make an informed choice across both decisions. Um, and similarly at the level of the policymaker to be able to balance those two outcomes. It's also important to understand the sustainability profile of a food within a given food environment. So kind of thinking of how does the choice of this food compare to the other ones that are available within that food environment. And to also consider affordability as it relates to both healthy diets and sustainable diets. There's additional work that needs to be done on coming up with sustainability indicators that are relevant for different types of private sector actors, including not just large corporations, but also SMEs. And always certainly work needs to be done on more engagement on data uptake and use and really holding stakeholders to account based on the data that we present. Um, so I hope that I've shown you um, both that there's an impressive amount of work already done um, and still ongoing within the space and suggested some more potential areas that um, it can be advanced through your work and the work of Infamous in the future. I do think that we have a strong foundation to build on, but continued focus on improving food systems monitoring is essential to reduce the burden of malnutrition and bring food systems within global environmental limits. Thanks. <laughs>